Welcome back to another episode Sailing Ruby Rose in Vietnam. I am with my friend Mike, who is also general manager of Seaman Catamarans and Corsair Marine International. Now today and behind me, we have the mast and the mast setup for the Seaman 1600. Now the 1370 mast and setup is gonna be very, very, very similar. So welcome Mike, thanks for taking us back into your factory. Hi Nick. Hi guys. What are we going to talk about today? Well, we're just going to go through and have a look at our mast section in general. We will focus a bit on the 1370 components, but just actually a run through, because we do our own masts here for all of our Corsair trimarans, as well as all of our sea winds. We've got carbon masts, we've got aluminium masts, rotating masts, and we do all of our own componentry in terms of booms and running rigging, that sort of stuff. But then we also get in a lot of componentry from overseas. This is a prime example. So we've got an 1160 rig here. Now you've got an aluminium tube that we get extruded through one of our suppliers, all yacht spas in Australia. So this is nearly finished and ready to go out. We've got a boat launch fairly soon. Just going back to the start though, what we've got is all our sections down the back here. So these sections come out of Australia, as I said, from all yacht spas. We get three or four containers per year and they come in pre-anatized, but they're blank tubes only. So yep. we're really getting just a straight tube. And then the guys here will vary different in section sizes for the different boats, but then we'll then do all of our fits out. And a lot of the componentry also comes from all yacht spas as well. We're currently at the base of an 1160 mast, you've got a gooseneck fitting, for example, but we're doing all of this work. We're doing all of the dressing of the mast, all of the cutouts okay. and uh, installation. Just one thing I want to check. Yeah, you have a dedicated conduit for in here, do you? Conduits, yeah. yeah. All the rigs come with conduits inside. Yep. And then, I mean, obviously, if we get a boat with a lot of options, then we'll perhaps put in an additional conduit. And some people are asking, can I fit this? Can I fit that? And there's a lot of technology coming out where people are trying to get bigger equipment on the mast head. And you've got to be careful, especially when you start putting things like radars in, where you think, oh, the cable's this size but oh, the head yeah. is that size yeah, yeah. So can you fit it through yeah. the conduit no, absolutely but yes we do typically have a single conduit installed and you've got an exit at the spreader and then the same at mast head cool. yeah cool. okay so extruded aluminium who thought we'd ever be talking about that? This is our mast. Correct. That's the 1370 rig. That's a 310 section. So you've got the 1600, which is a 340. We've got the 310 for the 1370, and then we go down to a 250, the 1260. So they're the size comparison. And as you can see, it's a full raw section, comes in the container. And then we've got all our other sections that come through as well. So we get the sleeves, we get the booms, all sorts of different components out of Australia. So that's our mast and that's probably part of our rigging. Yes, you just want to come down and have a look here. We got rigging that we get out of uh, oil yacht spas as well. The rigging coming through is pre-swaged for our cap shrouds, our four stays. So on your boat, the rigging, the cap shrouds and the four stay uh, die form. That's the one by 19. So there's our mast, there's our rigging. Yep. Let's go and talk through the 1600 mast because that one's already fitted and ready to go. Super excited about this. I'm kind of to actually see our mast. Like we've got engines, we've got a hull. Now we've got a mast. Whatever next, Mike? Getting pretty close. All right, let's go and move on. Here we are, Lucas. Lucas, production manager for the Corsair Trimarans. Welcome, Lucas. Lucas, tell us about what you have in your hand now. Thanks, Nick. Good morning. Welcome to our factory. Here in my hands, I have the uh, synthetic rigging cap shrouds for the 880. So on the 880, which is our sport model, is our more sporty performance oriented boat. We are using synthetic rigging as a standard. This is Dyneema, heat set Dyneema. It's stronger than your off the shelf Dyneema. Yep. So the idea with this is that when you heat set, you lock in the stretch of the Dyneema. Yep. So you don't have something that's called crimp, which is the ability of Dyneema to stretch. So heat stretch Dyneema. Exactly. Okay. It's essentially, it's like it's pre-stretched, right? So yeah, you don't yeah. get that. Quick. Yeah, basically, it's that. So that obviously saves a lot of weight. Yes. If I put you on the spot, how much weight does it save? Sixty percent. Sixty percent. See, I knew. I knew you would know all this stuff. <laughs> okay, so sixty percent weight saving on conventional stainless steel. Yes. And one by nineteen. Rigging. One by nineteen. Okay, fine. But so, it's also the important thing is, I mean, weight on the boat is critical, but it's also the location of that weight. Yeah. If you can save weight when you're at the top of the rig. That's obviously a huge advantage for, yes. the, for the motion. So the one thing that has always terrified me about this sort of thing is chaff, either finding a rubbing point. And so we talked a lot about synthetic rigging on Ruby Rose and how when we were crossing the Atlantic, we chaffed through multiple lines because of the swell on the river. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is more prone to chaff. Yes. Would you advise this on an ocean going blue water vessel or is it more for like racing? I think it's better for racing on a blue ocean cruiser 
you're checking in all the time. This type of uh, optional equipment for ocean-going boats is all about competency. Yes. And what it is you're trying to achieve. Yep. If you're a cruiser and you want to just enjoy life cruising, then you should be going with stainless rigging because it's pretty bulletproof. Yep. If you want to go fast, option this. It's going to perform better. Yep. But you have with that, like all things, you know, it's a balance. You have to do more inspections. You have to make sure you're doing your rig tuning more regularly. Yep. Just double checking for those chafe points. But I mean, as you'll see here, you're running through a pretty decent sheath here. It's stainless fitting, you quite a it. large oh, radius. So you know, yes. I mean, with us, it was literally because the sheets from our foresail rubbing against the shrouds that wore that sure. out. So it's actually an, an issue of that. Thank you, Lucas. Let's move on to something else. This is all super interesting. And uh, we'll follow Mike and Lucas around. See what's got next. Okay, so all of our rigs, I mean, we're, we're shipping boats obviously all around the world. So our rigs are ranging from 17 to 21 meters. So they come in two parts and we have to sleeve them. So this essentially is one half of an aluminium rig. This sleeve, all it is, is actually a mast section. If you just come down here a little bit, you can see that's the bottom half of a mast. We've got a section that we put in, which we then take the back section out of. We then fold it around, insert it in, and then we rivet one half, and then we can then counter sink okay. and, uh, and bolt the other half. So that means that you can transport the bolt? More yes. than anything like transportability. Exactly right. right. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at the, your performance boats, you're looking at a one-piece yeah. carbon mast, right? Yeah. That's the, the ultimate. We have to ship them to bring the price of the shipping down. We have to put them on the deck. That's how we then join them. It gets completely pre-assembled prior to dispatch, yeah. and then we disassemble it. So we make sure all of the rigging's in place. Okay, so this aluminium mast, and now we've got these other two that we're going to talk about. Aluminium mast is standard on the 1370, right? Correct, yeah. Carbon option? We have got a carbon option. Okay. Let's move on, talk about the rotating mast. Now we're back with Lucas and we've gone from the other end of the spectrum. So at one end we've got aluminium, at the other end we've got carbon and rotating. Exactly. First, can you explain what a rotating mast is for me? I was going to say for people that don't know, but that's me. Okay, basically a rotating mast is a mast that is put onto a ball in the deck, which goes in here, here. Yep. And it's pivoting around this point, basically, like this. Yeah. It does a little bit of this. Yep. So as it's moving on a ball, you have degrees of rotation. Okay. Now what, what benefit does that confer? What you can do is align your mast into the wind and you actually use it as part of the sail. So basically you're using the mast as part of the sail. Right. Okay. So you rotate, the mast rotates, so the boom has to move less because we have movement in the mast, which means you get a better foil shape for your sail. Exactly. But I just ask, from a logical point of view, how does it work if you've got a rotating mast with the shrouds? On our smaller boats, we use a big bow shackle on the top, yep. where you have everything is hooked in, and then you all rotate the mast. On bigger masts like this one, where you need the uh, shrouds, they are pulling stronger. Yeah. You need to have a bar, a through bar that goes on the mast, right, so okay. it holds the whole thing. Okay, fine. Everything has to be able to articulate, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as you yeah. say. The yeah. boom needs to articulate as yeah. it goes around. The caps are obviously moving. The forestay has movement as well, hence the big yeah. uh, bow. So that's why we have the sheaves on the on the top. Yes. Where we saw on the caps. Another question: Can I make the assumption that a rotating mast is not a beginner's item? No, it's not. So basically this is increased performance, increased complexity, increased maintenance. But people that really know their sailing are happy to forgo the ease of use for the increase in performance, right? Exactly. And that's sort of fairly true representation of our Corsair Trimaran customers. They are not first time buyers typically. They're people that have had a few boats, understand some of the rig tuning aspects, some of the sail trim, and they're understanding, yeah, rotating rigs is actually what I want to go fast. This is all part of the tweaks of how do you get the boat to perform. In the theoretical, if I took two identical boats, identical weather, identical skippers, identical knowledge base, one with a rotating mast, one with a fixed mast, mm -hmm. what percentage increase of performance am I getting with a rotating mast? 10 to 20 percent. 20 percent. It's as much as that. When you look at those sort of side profiles of a foil, right? Yep. And it's always, it's that front section where you've got that shape is where you're really generating the amount of lift. Yep. And that's what that's doing. It's just, instead of hitting a bullet style mast and then you've got the sail behind it creating a lot of lift, you're really creating that nice Chambered the, shape. Exactly, that yeah. camber right on the leading edge of the foil. And that is where you generate the, a large portion yeah. of your lift. So, so it really does. So the benefit, I'm assuming, so. therefore, is only upwind. You get you downwind also, because remember these boats, they are fast. So you're working with upper and wind. Mm. 
Yeah. So downwind, you're not that downwind. You're actually your wind is coming from yeah, the side, so it works also. Okay. And another question then is: Does that mean that if you're a rotating mast, the sailmaker has to be aware when they're building the sails, or are the sails identical? It does have a little bit of change, but mainly because the way the mast behaves is a slightly different. Okay. Especially when it comes to the tuning and how the mast bends, it's not the same when you have a fixed rigging as when you have something that is turning around. Okay, so your sailmaker needs to be aware that yes. mm. I've got to rotate yeah, yeah. muscles. Because I'm assuming that if there's less movement of this boom and you're creating a flatter foil, then you've got a slightly flatter profile to your sail. Correct, yeah. Yes. I mean, even just going from aluminium to carbon, the sailmaker needs to be aware of that because you're going to get a different shape. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know. So you have to... Well, you've got different, different characteristics. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. For a quick comparison, what we receive from our cell manufacturer is the amount of ribbon the mast has to have. Yep. For this mast, we're only working with 10%, whereas on a normal aluminum spar, we might be working with 50%. 50% ribbon? Yes. Wow. That's, That's pretty huge. huge. That is huge. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Carbon fiber rotating mast. Not for beginners. Okay, what have we got next? So we'll go and have a look at the 1600 rig that we've got to dress that's outside. Yep. It's ready for a boat that's going in the water in a couple of weeks time. Yep. Okay, 1600 mast and then we're going to talk in depth about the 1370 mast. So let's go to the next part of the factory. Okay, now we're outside. Now before we all like shrink from the heat, what do we got here, Mike? Okay, so we've obviously got the rigging shop inside and then we've got outside here, we do a final QC. So this is a 1600 mast. Just come out for its first QC session. Yep. So this mast is slightly different from the smaller sea winds. We actually paint this mast, so it's painted white, hence why we want to bring it outside, make sure we get really good light on it, just double check there's no paint defects. As well as uh, Lucas, who you met earlier, he's our trimaran production manager, but he also runs all of the mast and rigging side as well. Essentially, this mast is quite similar to the 1370 as well, which is what's going on your boat. Let's move through this mast and have a good look. Okay, Mike, here we are at the pointy end of the 1600 mast. What have we got, sir? Yeah, so mast head, I guess let's go right from the top. Firstly, you've got the lightning rod here. The idea is you've got this at the highest point of the mast, so you can see it's higher than the VHF antenna. The whole concept of the lightning protection system is it's the highest point, that's where the lightning will strike, being the highest point. You're then using the aluminium mast as the conductor, goes down and then the base of the mast, you then got a high voltage cable, which then goes down in the shortest route possible to a, a moonrake uh, earth plate. So you're dissipating all that power straight through the system. Then you've got a TV antenna bracket here. We've got the bracket for the BNG masthead wind unit, which comes out of the front of the mast. Yep. And then you've got your VHF antenna here also. All of these cables are running down conduits. This boat is a 1600 with a tricolor. The 1370 as standard comes with a uh, all-around white, the same as our 1260s, 1160s. We are aware that you need to have a tricolour for certain events. We haven't actually got it on the options yet, but we will have to offer a tricolour, I believe, yep. moving forward. Cool, cool. Then also just at the back, we've got the topping lift here, and then we've got the main halyards, and then a bracket at the back to be able to put your Windex option. Okay, let's move down. So we're just coming down the mast a little bit and we get to our first uh, fitting. So this is the Spinnaker Halyard Exit, as you can see, and set up here with a, a block for two to one. Yep. Coming down to the next part, you've then got your Screecher Halyard Connection. And again, as you can see, that's a two to one. The Screecher's got a lot more load on it than the Spinnaker, obviously. And yeah, I mean, just a good point to, to notice here, if you can uh, see, we've got obviously the shackle fitting. You've got spaces here, and then we have the shackles done up with a wire through it to make sure we got that. Um, a nice uh, Manel wire. Yeah. This is what I like to see, yeah. Manel wire. And the other thing is probably worth mentioning, now we've got everything covered up here, but split pins. We often see riggers that take split pins and they take them all the way around and you actually don't need to do that. You can actually cause yourself more trouble by thinking you're doing a great job by pulling that split pin all the way around. You're only looking for the split pin to go through and then you're looking at like a 45 degree angle only. That's what you're looking for. You imagine if you bend it all the way around, you're fatiguing that part of the split pin. Yep. Okay. So, okay, so now we're down onto the force day lug. And again, we put our spaces there. Obviously hugely important to the boat. A lot of force going through this component of the mast. Brilliant, thanks mate. What else have we got? So just walking down, so the next part is the jib halyard. Yep. Worth noting, we've just done the screecher, the spinnaker, and then the jib halyard. So those are all run down to the mast base. We've got a winch at the mast base and terminated there with jammers, okay. which will be the same on the 1370. In your boat, you'll have the same. Okay. All the halyards will go down. The jib halyard, the spinnaker halyard, and the screecher halyard will go down to the mast base where you're terminated at a winch. Yep. But then like our other smaller sea winds, all the other rigging will then come back to the cockpit. 
Yeah, same okay. as Ruby Rose. Unless you're racing, you don't need to adjust your jib halyard. Yeah, when you've got it set up on a furler, exactly right. Uh, All the important stuff's back to the cockpit. Okay, um, this is a big yeah. lump of mast. <laughs> it's a no, big, it, it, it is. is a big lump. And as I said, yeah. we came from a 40 foot boat, but this is huge. All yeah. right. 20.5 meters, yeah. So this is obviously where the sleeve has gone. Yep. So sleeve here, yep. First set of spreaders. Indeed. Now this boat is all joined, it's a local launch boat, so the sleeve has been put together and we have to compress that together to get it in and then it's all been riveted, so that's finalised now. Most of the equipment we actually put down on the lower set of spreaders in terms of the radar and things like that, so coming down. This boat has an inner forestay on the 1600, we don't have that. We don't have that on the 1370, the 1370 doesn't require it. Then you've got your deck steaming combo. Now we've got an option to have a floodlight, sort of a larger LED on the 1370 as well, but this is the standard deck steaming combo that you get. Yep. Keep coming down, then you've got your lowers fitting there as well. Keep coming down, you've got a radar fitting on the mast here. That's your fitting. Yep. So when we talk about what fits through the conduit, we've got to make sure we can get these types of fittings through. You can see there's the exit here of the conduit there, it's coming through. Then we've got the jib sheet coming out on the front of the mast down there, so that comes down to the jib clue. And then we've got just our general running rigging exits here. So coming out on the 1600, we've got our spin lock jammers here, all in line with our mast base winch. We've got the spinnaker halyard, screecher halyard, jib halyard, and then we've got our, sorry, that's the storm jib. So that's the mid-mast halyard, yeah. And then if you just come down to the underside, you can see we've got everything set up with the track and uh, cars. Is this particular mast being put on the boat in Vietnam or is it being shipped somewhere to be? This boat's going to be launched locally. So this is a US customer taking delivery in Vietnam, sailing south. They're heading down to Batam, which is just opposite Singapore. Once Lucas and his team have done their QC check, any corrections they need to do, they will then uh, load it onto an articulated truck. that will then go down and meet the boat at the dock and then we'll crane it on and stand it. Cool. Yeah. Just a quick question, because I'm going to throw some stuff at you now. They're kind of an urban myth. Once you get a new rig and it's tuned, yeah. and you go sailing, how soon after its first sail do you need to relook at the rig for tuning? First sail. <laughs> I mean, that's us. We'll stand it, we'll tune it, we'll go out for a sail, we'll check it. And then tune it and again. And then tune it again. Yeah. And then probably before we actually do the handover with a customer, we'll give it a, another once over. We'll check okay. it. Yeah. So we'll probably be doing three checks. Obviously, each time you do it, the need to tune is far, far less. But yeah, in yeah. terms of checking it, yeah. There's checking and then there's adjusting. So checking is a constant thing. The other thing is, and this is the laziness, I know you're meant to use a lose gauge for like checking rigging tension. Like I used to just use two fingers, just like a yeah, Kit Kat. It's again, it's all about competency, right? So yeah. if you've got the knowledge and experience to understand when you're giving it a bit of a lean, you understand what's happening, whether yeah. it's taut enough or not, tensioned it up or not, then you're fine. But if you don't have it, then you have to start using tools yeah, so yeah. you do understand no, no, no. it. But personally, I'd say if you don't have the competency to understand that, then get somebody else to do it. Yeah. It does understand the manual test and if you have got the competence to do it then that's fine yeah just another point this is like real basic stuff but the difference between the rig on a cat and a rig on a monohull is huge there's a different hole different shroud arrangement there's no backstays i have a whole heap of learning to start with again you know, watch this space because mike and lucas are going to be teaching me they don't know this yet but they are yeah, I mean, it's just the whole very nature of how the mast has to perform. On a monohull, you've always got that point of the boat trying to find that equilibrium of being able to heal. A cat doesn't have that ability yeah. to be so forgiving. You don't fly a hull on a sea wind, which means that rig's got to take all that load yep. if you've got too much canvas up. Yep. So the loads you get on a mast are incredibly large and you have to be able to handle that. You have to be able to make sure that you've got to, you know, as, as with all your equipment, make sure everything is in the right condition to handle that sort of stuff. and. Start by numbers. Exactly, start, start by, by numbers. numbers. Okay, brilliant, okay. Mike. Great. Okay. And now finally we're at the... Uh, yeah, so the we're down at the base here. So on the 1600, we've got a similar setup to the 1370. So the 1600, some of the running rigging comes down the base of the mast, under the wing deck, goes along and then comes back up to a central winch in the cockpit. Yep. We do that to try and keep all of the decks nice and clean, get the running rigging off the decks. On our sea winds, the smaller sea winds, 1160, 1260, 1190, we come down the mast, out the side of the mast and then you very much see them across the deck right mm -hmm. very very functional and extremely practical to be honest with you quite bulletproof because you can always chase lines you can see them. you have got that running rigging across the deck 1370 we're doing a little bit of a hybrid in that we're not running underneath the boat we're coming down the base of the mast and we'll have a bracket where the running rigger will come down go out and then it's going underneath some covers below the deck, which you can pull off and you can access, so you are able to sort of trace the lines and things like that. But essentially we're getting a clean deck with no running rigging, but using our 
small boat layout and geometry coming down the mast, around the side of the cabin tops, along and then up to our dual helm, which is what we like to have. So essentially you've got that safe helm position where you've got all your running rigging coming down to both sides of the cockpit. But the lines, when they exit the base of the mast, will be visible before they go into the... Just for a short section, yeah, we're just before it goes under the cabin top. We've done standing rigging, we've done the masts. Let's talk running rigging, and yet, for those of you half asleep, we are getting through this. Lucas, running rigging, it is actually important. What we got? Well, here's where we got all the ropes we use. Most of the ropes are coming from Australia. They're certified, which is important. Yep. important. So we start with Dyneema. Yep. This is the heat stretch Dyneema we use on the cap shroud. So that's super yep. important to have something certified and we can trace ability. Okay. But then we have different kind of ropes. We have ropes which are more for general use. We have some docking ropes. There's also a little bit of nylon over there, which is for docking. Then we have all kind of rope. For example, it's double braid, yep. polyester, polyester. So these are general use rope. It's a good rope, strong, flexible, it's good for the hand. Yes. I do know there's only two types of rope on a boat, and we're not going to go into lines and halyards and all this other stuff. When it's in a box, it's a rope. For the pedants out there. <laughs> Lucas, let's move on. That's more the uh, rigging stuff. Rigging stuff, and now we've got the running rigging. So you got different types of uh, Dyneema. Yep. For something that is more strong, we need more strength. You want to use it on the booms or on the, for example, the apple rope. Yep. Just before the tackle. Or, by example, for holding the uh, nets. Okay, cool. You would say nets? Trampolines. Yeah, trampolines. Dyneema yeah. trampoline. Yeah, yes. because UV degradation on those always scares me. You jump up and down all of a sudden like yeah. you're in the water. Cool. So we use Dyneema. And so, no UV did. No. Do you splice your own? Yes, we do all the splicing and everything in here. Can you splice? House. I can do it. <laughs> how long does it take you to ice splice? It's not how long, it's how many burns on your hand you have. <laughs> Honestly, for me it's cut. It <laughs> takes me hours to do ice splicing. Can you teach me ice splicing? Well, yeah, we can do it. Okay, off, off record, I need to learn to ice splice better. Thank you, Lucas. Now let's go and look at the boom. The boom. So we've now got one final component and then I think our whole rig is complete. And so we come to the last piece of this puzzle, the boom and the whole boom system. Mike, talk us through this, my friend. We're on the same 1600 mast and boom. We're just packed up, ready to dispatch this one. It's already been QC checked. And basically this is just at the end of the boom here on the clue end. And just talking through what we've got, we've got three reef lines coming out the back with sheaths. And then you've got your outhaul as well, bringing the tension on the clue. And that all goes down to the gooseneck end and then through reef lines coming back to the cockpit. Another thing that's on this boat that will be common to the 1370 is this preventer line as well. So you can see here, this comes out of the sheave in the base of the boom, and then you've got a Wichard snap shackle on the base of it. Essentially, you're using that. If you've got your boom out wide, you can use that as a bridle arrangement to be able to hold your boom out further. So basically, this unclips. So say yep. that you've got your boom out to starboard, yep. and you just clip that onto an attachment point on that side. Yeah, depending on where you are, you can either do it to a cleat or to a pad eye out on the rail, and essentially, you've got a bit more security in keeping your... So there's, there. there's, a, there's a reinforced pad eye somewhere yes, to attach it yes, to. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. That then goes through mast base down and then around back to the cockpit to so, you can, so you can tension it on the winch. So you're at the helm, you release the jammer, free, pull it down, connect it, back to your helm, and then you can then pull it through the winch next to your helm. Yeah, and for those of you who haven't done any ocean sailing, it is super imperative that you run preventers. Essentially, because a lot of it is downwind, if you back the mainsail on this and it's a big old lump and you jibe the boat, a broken gooseneck is probably the least of your worries. Yeah. So yeah. always, always run your preventers. So just other fittings, the sail bag itself has got battens running through it and that'll then tie up to your topping lift coming down. And then we'll have a zipper on the sail bag, which you can see this pulley here. It's fully arrangement. So basically you can run the zipper both ways on a loop. Really? Yeah. That's clever. So that way you can stand at the other end and pull it all up. Yep. So this is the netting system, which is going to be similar on the 1370. Oh yeah, the 1600 is a much bigger boat and this rail system is quite substantial. On the 1370, we're just trying to bring that weight down a little bit, being a smaller boat, where we're going to have a much more lightweight system, but there's a cradle yep. to be able to catch the main when it comes down. So you've got your bag, which is held up with the lazy jacks, but when your sail comes down, ultimately, if it's got a nice shape to it and a base to it, you'll be able to get it to flake reasonably yeah, yeah. well. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. So a similar setup, we'll have brackets similar to that going along the length of the boom, but we're going for a much more lightweight version, but still being able to catch the main. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. So listen, that is the boom. So we've done the mast, we've done the boom, we've done the standing rigging and the running rigging. I really, really hope you enjoyed that episode. Honestly, it's another big constituent part of a sailboat. Some would say after the hull, the most important. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Give us a like, give us a thumbs up. 
Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so because you would be mad to not be subscribed if you are into boat building. And I will see you really soon with another episode. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys. Bye.